New Year. A great <laughs> reminder that recording is in progress. A uh, great reminder of the Lord's faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning, but they're new every year as well, aren't they? And we are here by grace. We have every day by grace. Special welcome to you if you're with us online. Always lovely to have you with us. Uh, and if you don't know me, my name's John Hobbs. Uh, I'm the minister here at Grace Church. And uh, during this COVID time, that means if we are here in the Woodside, um, we need to wear masks if we're over 11, unless we're exempt from that, though we're allowed to take them off to sing or to eat or to drink uh, at those times. Uh, and if you are here for the first time, everything's up here behind me. It's all very easy uh, to follow and the children will go out part way through and I'll explain that when we get there. As always, though, let's start by quietening ourselves. The chance, if you've not yet had a chance, to prepare yourself to worship the living God who is with us in a very special way as we gather. So whether you're a child, younger, older, whatever you are, let's have a moment of quiet. A chance for you, perhaps to say sorry for something that's happened today, to ask God to speak with you through his word, to draw out your heart to him in praise and prayer. A moment for quiet and for your own prayers. Well, let's draw those prayers together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Psalm 90 begins, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you for that truth that in the midst of all the ups and downs of life, all the joys and pains, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we praise you that that means there is constancy in our lives. That, that means that you are always ever present, never asleep to our needs. It means that we have a father always there, full of compassion and care towards us, on whom we can call and who is worthy of our praise. And as we gather this afternoon, oh God, we pray that you'd help us to come not putting aside all the burdens of the week, but bringing them before you through the cross. We pray, Lord, that you would meet with us in your words and by your spirit, that you'd meet with us as we sing and pray and gather around your table. You'd meet with us in our fellowship together as your people, this spiritual temple in which you live here on earth. And as you do, Lord, that you would... Remind us of yourself and strengthen us as your children. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, musicians do come up and we're going to start with that great song, 10,000 Reasons. And you'll know as we've gone through the book of Exodus that this picks up on that declaration of God's name in Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Let's stand, shall we, and praise him together.
Well, as we stand at the beginning of this year, we've just sung of how we'll praise God for 10,000 and forevermore. So why not call to mind something you're thankful for from this last year about God or his works? And let's have a time of open prayer and response, a chance for you to pray out some short prayers of thanks and praise to him. We thank you so much for your love and protection of this your church family here in Bongor and Hempstead. Oh man. Father God, thank you that you sustain us and always provide us need. Oh man. Oh man. We thank you that despite lockdowns, your spirit moves in so many happy ah. things of faith. Ah. Oh man. Thank you for your uh, love and your permission to come and share today. Amen. Oh, man. Father, thank you for your unending love for us, even in the darkest of days. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, do take your seats, please, everyone. And each new year, it's been our practice to renew our commitment, if you like, our covenant commitment to the Lord as we come around his table, uh, our commitment, therefore, to Christ for all that he gives to us, our readiness to serve him as our king and brother and friend. So uh, we're going to have a, a, a reading uh, now, Michaela is going to come and read something to us, which comes from when Joshua renewed the covenant with Israel back in Joshua 24. Michaela, up you come. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Brilliant, thank you so, so much. Well, look, when Israel fa faced new stages in their history, this is what they would do. They would renew their commitment to the Lord. So as we face a new stage of 2022, you know, 2,000 years and more since Christ was born, uh, that's what we're, we're trying to do. And this covenant meal is a picture of all that God has for us in Christ. Well, kids, if you can have a look at that uh, little Bible verse, uh, verses up there, um, it's all about worshipping the Lord, isn't it? But can any of you spot what Israel are not to do in those verses up there? It's probably one for older kids. Can anyone tell me what they're not to be doing according to those verses? Anyone want to give me an answer? Yeah, Elijah. That's right. So... Their kind of great, 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 great grandparents were not worshipping the Lord. They were worshipping other gods, other religions. So God's saying, don't go after them. And there's another don't, isn't there? Can you see they're also not to serve gods? Where else are they not to serve? Not just their ancestors. Anyone spot another one? Yeah. The gods of the Amorites, the gods of the people who lived around them as well. And so as we renew our commitment to the Lord, we're saying yes to him, but no to other religions, because we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're saying no to the sort of things that perhaps our friends and neighbours that we really love, but the things that they go after instead of the Lord, you see. And it's interesting, isn't it, to think about some of the things that our neighbours bow down to, and a bit like we would bow down with our lives to God. Sometimes when they grow up, it can be getting as much money and a bigger and bigger house, and doing as possibly well they can in their job, in order to look well towards others. But maybe at school, there's other things that people go after in a way they should go after God. 
It might be the boyfriend or the girlfriend. It might be actually they're really going after getting every, acceptance by everyone else and being as cool as they could be. And those things become the big thing for them. But the Lord wants us to have him as the big thing, doesn't he? You see? But can you also see up there, at the end of those verses, who does Joshua, as a dad, who's he speaking for at the end of those verses? Can anyone give me an answer to that? Yeah, James. His kids. That's right, his household. I meant to bring an umbrella today. I know I've done this before for you. But there's a sense in which when you're your children, our faith as your parents, it's a bit like a big umbrella over you. We say yes to Jesus for ourselves. We say yes to Jesus for you as well. But of course, as you grow up, you've got to say yes to Jesus for yourself too, haven't you? One day, you might be a mum or a dad where you're saying yes to Jesus and you're helping your children grow up for him as well. So as we renew our commitment to the Lord today, we're not just saying yes for ourselves, but parents and grandparents, we're also saying yes for our households, that we want those we love and we've got responsibility for to walk with the Lord as well. We're giving ourselves to that uh, for a new year. Well, the Israelites heard from Joshua what God had done for them, and then they made their commitment. So we're going to do the same. We're going to say a creed, that's a statement of belief. It's called the Nicene Creed for no other reason than it was kind of found, founded in that place in about the fourth century. So Christians have always said these words. And it's a way of recounting the things we believe God has done for us. And if you're a Christian, I invite you to say these words, but only if you mean them because we don't want to say anything that we're not really meaning. And then after that, there'll be a few other commitments about living in the light of that, uh, just as Joshua committed him and his family uh, to do. So can I ask you all to stand as we do this? And in the creed, just so that um, uh, we can know who's saying what, I'm saying the bits in capitals. And then when we get to the commitments, it turns around the other way, but it should be quite obvious. Um, so, do you believe and trust in God the Father together? I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Do you believe and trust in God the Son? I believe and trust in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, do you believe that this great salvation is received solely as a gift of God's grace in Christ, not as a reward for moral or religious efforts, but through a trusting faith that calls on him for mercy and submits to him as Lord? I do. So will you now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness? Will you devote yourself to the Bible's teaching, to this fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer? Will you seek to submit to Christ's will and spread his word in every sphere of your life? As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. 
Brilliant. Well done. Do take your seats. And before we pray, I just thought it would be great in response to that for us to essentially commission ourselves as we go out into the year to seek to do that. So I, I'm hoping I'm not missing anyone out here. I won't ask you to stand because, uh, you know, the knees can only take so much. But just pop up your hand, would you, if you are a parent or grandparent? OK, look at that. Loads here. So we're commissioning you in your responsibilities as parents or grandparents uh, to honour Christ in your families and to spread his word there. Put up your hand if you are a full-time homemaker or someone in paid work. All right, there we go. Look at that. Loads more of us. So we're being commissioned out into our workplaces, whether in the home or outside the home, to honour Jesus there, to shape those according to his word and to make his, him known. Put up your hand if you are a pupil at school or college. Okay, lots of you. So you're being commissioned to go out into school tomorrow or college and to seek to live for Jesus there, to display what he's like and how you are with those around you uh, and to share his message with them or invite them to where they can hear it. Put up your hand if you are a neighbour to someone. Uh, I hope that's all of us, isn't it? Okay, so we're being commissioned to honour Christ in our neighbourhoods, to get to know those who live around us, to love them and serve them, even if perhaps they live in ways that we wouldn't choose to live, just as Jesus drew alongside everyone. Okay, last one. Put your hand up if you're part of this church. Hey, good. Okay, so we're being commissioned to do those things in our serving at Grace Church too. And it is a joy for all of us here, serving in all sorts of different ways. Well, let's bow our heads, shall we, uh, and pray for one another in this. Gracious God, we have affirmed some wonderful truths and made some sincere commitments. But we realise that we can do that only because of your grace at work within us, your grace that forgives us where we inevitably fail to keep these, but also empowers us to do so more and more. And in the light of that, Father, we commit ourselves to you and to this work you've called us to, of being this royal priesthood in Hayward Seath and Sussex and the UK and belong. Father, would you help us, please, to display and declare Christ in all these different spheres that you call us to and you scatter us into every week. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, brilliant. Well done. Well, this is a point where kids are going to go out. Let me just explain who that is. So if you have a preschool child, it's first room up there to make sure that they've taken up there. And if you haven't registered, that you do. If we could just hold back for a moment. Uh, and then the second room is up to year two, reception to year two. Again, parents, do take your children up. Uh, and off you go do that now. And as they do, let's turn to each other, say Happy New Year and catch up with those around us. <laughs> Okay, well, do draw your conversations to a close. Jamar, could you pop up into notices? 
Uh, just to give some uh, notices, it's quite easy this week. Uh, community groups are back uh, uh, with a vengeance, I like to say. It sounds like a, a new movie for 2022, but they are back. So um, do enjoy those this week, re-engaging in fellowship uh, around God's word. Uh, and Impact and Salt are back as well. Um, and Impact uh, and Salt Teasers. Uh, do you think about who you might invite to come along in the new beginning of a new term? It's a really good way to play out that role God's given us of being the go-betweens between him and the world. Invite people to come and join you. Uh, and with that, the only other thing really to mention is that we want to be uh, leafleting the whole village and surrounds with a flyer that on one side tells everyone about impact um, and on the other side tells everyone about our Hope Explored course that people can register with online, as we were saying at Christmas. And uh, can I encourage you to think about whether you could give an hour or so this week to helping us with that. We have had people sign up for our courses just because they've had a leaflet through the door in the past. And it'd be wonderful if we had that again. Um, and likewise, with seeing some more folk at Impact. So if you can help with that, please speak to Tom Bourne. Um, he'd love to hear from you in that. I think the only other thing to mention is that we are gonna have a church meeting after our service not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after. And all that means is that we can tell the service so it stops at five. Kids stay upstairs watching a DVD and then we'll have a, an hour church meeting where we will cover some business at the beginning of the term. So more on that later in the week. Anything else to say, Luke, Tom, Tom? Uh, I've got one question. Okay. So, uh, what about the this Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant that's such good news it really is because i think the kids have really missed out let's just say a quick prayer for that shall we father we thank you so much for that christian union restarting we pray for tom and katrina and others involved in it help them to um, do what's necessary for that we pray lord that we would see our young people go and many others too we pray you might draw into that those who don't yet know christ that they might hear of him and Father, we do pray that you'd open the door for the Christian Union at Oat Hall to start up as well. Likewise, we pray for other schools around. We think of Ardingly and Burgess Hill Girls and uh, Chaley. Um, we pray for all these different schools. that There might be the opportunity for these same Christian unions to be started there uh, as places of sanctuary and growth uh, in the midst of the school week. Amen. Good. But well, look, before we move on, um, I'm really excited to uh, talk to Lauren about something we're, we're going to launch uh, this week. So Lauren, do you want to come up? Happy New Year. Yeah. This is Lauren. Lauren and Andres uh, been in the church for a while now. Been there. Yeah, How long is this? About two years. Two years, yeah. Excellent. And... Um, a while ago, I chatted to Lauren about um, an idea that we'd had for really putting into practice what you see in the New Testament, where the believers shared one with another. Um, and the question was, is there an app, like a sort of neighborhood app or something like that, where we could, if we wanted to, put what we've got on it so that others in the church know, well, I don't need to go and buy the same thing as so-and-so down the road. I can borrow what they've got. And they're very happy to share that, whether it's something practical like a lawnmower or something fun like a rowing boat, you know. That, 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 we've got a rowing, a rowing boat, so that you can, you're all welcome. To, so, so that's what we talked about. And it struck me that's a wonderful idea because it not only puts into practice our care of one another, it actually helps people that have got a bit less to enjoy from what the rest of us have got. It means that we're saving some money we can give to other good things and we're saving the environment as well. And you volunteered to have a look into it. <laughs> and I've actually come up with a Google form being the easiest way to do it. So tell us a little bit, Lauren, about about that and kind of how it's going to work. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, basically, me and Andrew just looked and looked and looked. Basically, for about a year through lockdown, different apps and things like that. Um, bizarrely, we didn't come across anything that would be able to facilitate even, you know, just us guys. Um, so if you do know anything, do let me know in the meantime. But um, for now, our solution is to have a Google Doc. Um, and in the Google Doc, it will have um, a series of tabs kind of by category. So it might be kitchen or garden or whatever, you know, sport or anything like that. And any item um, that anybody's willing to share. So don't share it if you, you know, you're not willing to have accidents happen or anything like that. But if you're willing, you know, to put it out there and share, 
um, then just email me. I'll um, give you my email in a minute, and I'll basically comprise a big, um, just like a big inventory, basically. Um, it'll just be simple info, like um, the item, who, who's the contact, and the phone number, things like that. Um, and then it will be made accessible to everybody once we've got a bit of a thing going. Um, and you'll just be able to put like a little cost in the box if you've um, borrowed it and just say, you know, for example, John's got a lawnmower and I borrow it. Um, I'll just put a cross in the box and say, currently borrowed by Lauren, given back on this day, something like that. Um, I'll be doing all the inputting, so all you have to do is send me an email. So have a think, no rush, no pressure. Um, you can join them if you want to, you don't have to. Um, but if there is anything that you do want to share, just let me know. Um, I think maybe later on a group chat, I'll put my email or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's just as simple as that, really. Um, next month or so, just have a think. Um, it doesn't have to be big, even. It could just be like a picnic blanket or a kayak, I don't know, kayaking, anything that's just, it's easy to share um, and you're happy to let others use, really. So, yeah, that's it. Brilliant. I, I, and I think this thing's going to grow a little bit. I think we'll probably be thinking, oh yeah, I could do that. So, you know, I can't see any reason why you couldn't say, um, uh, you know, if we're not in, my house could be free for something. Or uh, if you want to hold a dinner party and we'll space that, you could use our house. You know, they might not want to do that. Or we've got two cars, you could borrow a car if the car breaks down. Or even garage space, we've got some garage space. So just try and think as creatively as you can. My hunch is you don't want me to say, here's a list of 30 tools, uh, but maybe to say, I've got a whole load of tools in the shed around this kind of thing, if you want to get in touch, you know. So we can really make this thing work. Lauren, tell me why you think, because you, you were really up for this, so tell me why you're really up for it, why this is something that excites you. Well, just like what John was saying earlier, I think, you know, nowadays, it's, I think basically we live quite individualistic lines. Um, it would be really lovely given the size of our church um, if we were able to bless women over this way. Um, some churches are so massive, this would be like a, a, a really big operation. But I think because most of us live, you know, in quite a close radius and because, you know, we are quite a, a quite, in some ways, informal church, quite you know, friend, friendly and open and stuff, I think it would be another way where we can really just integrate into each other's lives more and really bless each other and not just be like, this is my family unit, that's your family unit, but actually starting to help us see each other um, as a bigger family. Um, the early church would literally live, you know, in tents in the desert, and obviously we don't do that now, but this is a practical way that we can kind of live more in community um, and a way that we can actually best people who might be in need but might not have the courage to ask anybody. So if they know there's something they can go and check and they're in a hard time, they can just talk to that one person. It doesn't have to be a whole thing. Um, yeah, so I just think it's a very practical way of living out part of the gospel that's more challenging nowadays, really. I think that last one's so important, isn't it, that actually it's, it stops it from being an embarrassing thing to say, can I borrow it? The good boys say, yeah, we're really up for that. Um, so just to clarify for us, finally, what, what's happening next then? What do we need to do? Okay, so I'm going to put my email address um, in the group chat later after the service. Um, once you've had a think about some things, um, send me all your items and your contact details um, in an email. I'll put on the group chat the things I want from you, like name, number, things like that. Um, and we'll go from there. Please, please don't send me an email, one for every item, try and group all into one um, email, but I think that's it. And then once um, I've got a good number of things on there, I'll let John know and we can update you maybe on Sunday or something like that. Yeah. Brilliant, Lauren, thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, and I, I'm, it may take a bit of time to craft that email, but it's gonna bless other people. And then we can add to it or take away from it as we see fit, um, as the time goes by. Well, look, in the light of that, it'd be great to pray, wouldn't it, for that and many other things. So David uh, Guthrie is going to come and lead us in our prayers. So let's bow our heads uh, as he does. Before we pray, as usual, we read a portion of a psalm. This time it's all of Psalm 101. A psalm of David. I will sing of your love and justice. To you, Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. 
when will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithful, faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor is in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks fal falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you as our creator, but you have not only created us, our world and our universe, you have also shown that you love us with a love that we do not deserve. In response to that love, we pray for strength so that in our daily lives, we will try to copy what David has promised to do in the Psalm just read. May we praise you, not only when we regularly meet together on Sundays, but also by how we live our daily lives. May we always try to walk blamelessly and may we be determined to avoid anything and anyone that would lead us astray, especially help us to be faithful in our praying. Unfortunately, frighteningly high levels of COVID are once more making headlines around the world. We pray, Father, again for an end to this and that numbers would decrease. We thank you for how the NHS has been coping and we thank you for how treatment has improved during the past two years. Protect, bless and sustain those who are working so hard on our behalf. And we pray for those who currently have COVID that you will grant them healing and the patience to endure the effects of the virus. Bless and sustain their families also of those who are ill. And grant wisdom to our and other governments as to how the current situation should be handled. And Lord, we pray that people will continue to behave sensibly when risks are high. We thank you for the freedom we have in this country to worship freely. And though this is enshrined in our laws, it doesn't stop some people trying to victimize Christians and even discriminate against them. Thank you for organizations such as Christian Concern and the Christian Institute, which seek to defend Christians who are mistreated. And we praise you for news this week of two victories for the rights of Christians. The latest case against Asher's Bakery in Belfast was thrown out of the European Court of Human Rights. And Mary Onua, a nurse who won her case against the has won her case against the Employment Tribunal, which ruled that she was constructively dismissed and harassed for wearing a cross and a chain. We rejoice that the judgment makes clear that the cross is a Christian symbol, that it was a genuine sign of Mary's faith, and that wearing the cross was no more of a health risk than items worn by other members of staff or other religious dress. We praise you for these results and pray that you will bless those who assisted these defendants, that they may be blessed with similar success in further cases. Father, we know that while we lead fairly comfortable lives here, there is much poverty all around the world. And we pray for all the efforts to relieve those who are suffering through lack of food, housing, medical treatment, or anything else that we take for granted. Speak to your people that they would support such work. We would pray your blessing on Christian organizations who try to show your love by working and campaigning against poverty. And especially we pray for Tear Fund, and even more especially for the series of Tear Fund live events, which took place every night last week and which were streamed on the internet. We pray that they may raise both awareness of the needs that exist and also raise funds for helping to relieve those needs. We pray for your church in this country where there's, a much, where there's much misunderstanding and misinformation and dead wood around the subject of Jesus Christ and his church. Help your people to live lives that glorify you so that others may hear and see the truth. Bless the fellowship of evangelical, independent evangelical churches to which we belong and other similar bodies as they try to support individual churches and pastors in living and working faithfully for you. Help us, to remember those of our, help us to remember those of our members who are ill. Quite a few families have had COVID over the past months, and we pray that they may suffer no long-term effects. We pray that you will alleviate any effects they may still experience. And some of our number suffer from other long-term conditions, and we pray for them that we may and that we may continue to remember them 
in our prayers and to provide any material or practical helps we can. Finally, for ourselves and our witnesses of fellowship of your people, we echo words that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Since God chose us to be the holy people he loves, let us clothe ourselves with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Remember the Lord forgive us, so we must forgive others. Above all, let us close oursel clothe ourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in our hearts. And let us always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill our lives. And whatever we do or say, let us do it as representatives of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, David. Musicians are going to come up now. We're going to sing uh, Undone, which picks up really the, the problems in the book of Exodus, because we're finishing our series actually this morning, uh, because we shifted it from last term uh, as we stalled to do something on creation. And Undone uh, speaks of how by nature we craft idols, but it's the gracious presence of God that restores us and renews us. Let's stand and sing in remembrance of that. We 
And uh, all the kids, it's a chance for you to go to your group now, please do. And if you could walk and try and keep quiet uh, while you go up, that'd be brilliant because we'll be having the Bible read here. And Sarah Mackay is going to come if you'd like to turn to Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, uh, as she'll read that for us. Shall we pray first? Father God, thank you for writing your word down for us in the Bible. Thank you for being a patient and kind teacher. And as we read your word now, and as John preaches to us, would you help us to focus on you? Would you renew our minds? Would you help us to humbly change this week to be more like you? In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Ephesians 2, starting at verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Well, it's the end of that really to note. It's a picture of the church as a building. Can you see it's a temple in which God is living by his spirit? Uh, and the backdrop to that uh, is this thing, the tabernacle. Uh, and if you'd like to turn to uh, Exodus 40, we're going to read the last part of it as we finish a series that we were due to finish before Christmas. But it turns out in God's providence, it's just a wonderful message for the new year. Now, I put the picture up here because rather than read uh, all the details of making this tabernacle, which is a movable temple, it's a tent, as God was journeying with Israel through the desert before he got them to build a, 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 a brick building, a temple, when they settled in the land. Uh, and, you know, its instructions span all the way from chapter 25 to chapter 40, with just a, a bit in the middle where Israel go after that golden calf. So it's a big theme. Uh, and I just want to draw your attention before we get to our reading to what's going on there. You can see there's this outer courtyard. Uh, and in that, you can see a little bit of an altar with fire on it. You might not quite be able to see it at the back. But that's where they would make their offerings to God for the sin of the people. Uh, and just in front of that, there's a big bowl of water where the priest would wash all the blood off because it would have been a fairly bloody thing, if you can imagine it, morning and night, day after day, with others bringing extra sacrifices too. And then you've got the tent itself. And can you see there were two rooms to it? You see the outer room, you could only go into that if you were a priest and you're properly prepared. And in there, there were three signs of God's presence. There was a wonderful candlestick and the candlestick had light on it as a sign of the light of God's glory, always with the people. And then there was a table with what was called the bread of the presence on it, which was a sign of the table fellowship with God the people had because of those sacrifices. And then in front of the curtain, they would offer up incense as a sort of picture of that cloud of God's presence uh, with the people. But that curtain that split the tent into two, that was an awesome thing because behind that, was the most holy place where there was an ark of gold with gold cherubim on it and inside the ark the ten commandments on the tablets uh, and that was a place so holy that only the high priest could go in and only once a year offering blood to make amends for all the sins of the people that was where God's presence was especially manifest in Israel 
and therefore in the whole of creation of the universe. That was the spot. And the ark was like an invisible throne for this invisible God. And blood had to be put on the top of it to make amends for the way Israel had broken the commandments that were in the box. This was at the center of the camp of Israel. And every time they moved, they would unpack it and take it with them and then put it back up together again. Well, our reading comes from Exodus 40, verse 34. Do turn with it, would you? And we're going to read just the last few verses of the book of Exodus, which really tell us what the whole book has been about. The end of verse 33 tells us Moses finished the work of constructing this tent. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. And so says God's word. Now, if you've got the handout, it'd be great for you to follow that and fill in the boxes as we go. There's so much encouraging truth for us. So as we start, I just want to ask how you're feeling this new year. I hope for some of you, you're feeling delighted. Um, I always get a little bit of a boost at the new year thinking, okay, sleeves rolled up, let's get on with 2022. It can be a way of sort of rebooting yourself with energy. It may be that rather than delighted, you're feeling daunted by the year. Problems on the horizon that you just feel you're unable to handle. Perhaps you're feeling depressed as another year goes by with COVID. Another year goes by where you worry a bit about the culture and how it's influencing particularly those you love. Or would drained be the D that describes how you're feeling? Just exhausted, spiritually dry, maybe over the break, you've not really spent much time with the Lord. Unable how you're going to make it day by day. Well, look, Christians, there is one truth, I think, above all else to be encouraged by as we start our new year. Okay? And it's the theme of our passage. Do you want to know what it is? It's the presence of God. The presence of God. I'm not sure there is a more important or more encouraging truth. Daunting, yes, but encouraging. It begins and ends the Bible, doesn't it? We begin in a garden, God walking with Adam and Eve in Eden. We end in a garden, the new creation where God dwells with his people in the world made new. And just think of Matthew's gospel. Begins with the incarnation, Matthew 1.23. You can give me the answer. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, the very last words, Jesus, Matthew 28, 20, assuring his disciples as he sends them out. Surely I am with you. Always. It's a great word for the weary, isn't it? Well, just as it's the glorious goal of the Bible, it's the glorious goal of the book of Exodus. You may have seen, even if you've read it through, just how much detail there is about this tabernacle. It takes up almost half the book. You get the instructions, then you get the golden calf, and then you get them repeated almost word for word as the tabernacle's made. And you, you have to ask, if you're thoughtful in reading Exodus, what is all this here for? You know, why does God want it? There for us as Christian believers. And the answer is surely to stress the importance of these last few verses, of what happens when this great book ends. Verse 33, Moses finished the work. Verse 34, the cloud of God's glory covered and then filled the tabernacle. Last year, COP26, President Biden was arriving and there was a lot of preparation. Despite, you know, our concerns about carbon, he had five planes, 85 cars to get his entourage there. 
And, and do you know what? He even sent his security guards into Glasgow Hospital and they checked the whole thing out. They got plans of the whole place because if it so happened that something happened and Biden is getting on a bit and he was in the hospital, they needed to make sure the place was prepared for this president of all presidents. Well, those preparations, they signaled, didn't they, the importance of the one arriving. And so it is with the tabernacle. But it didn't just signal the importance of God, but the importance of him being present with his people. That is a couple of ways. Uh, in which the tabernacle speaks in it. It points us to Israel living with God in the new creation. One of the things that's often missed if you don't look at the detail is that actually a lot of it is shaped like uh, the creation of the world. There are seven commands uh, followed by Sabbath in the early part of the book, just like God made the world and then rested. Even those verses we've seen, Moses finished the work like God finishing the work of creation, and then God descends just as he went into that garden to be with Adam and Eve. And that candlestick I mentioned, God required it to be designed like a tree with blossoms on it, as you'd find in Eden. The cherubim, well, it was a cherubim that guarded the garden, wasn't it? The point is that this tent was a way that God was visibly reasserting his new creational order into the dark chaos of our world racked by sin. It was a pointer for them and all the more so for us that one day what we see in the tabernacle is going to become a reality in the whole world, God dwelling with his people. But it was also a protection for Israel as they sought to live with the living God in this creation. You know, just look at verse 35, who it is that descends into the tabernacle. We read that Moses himself couldn't enter because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I, I think it's a bit like a nuclear power station. I guess if you go to one, you don't need to get yourself dressed up much on the outside, but the closer you get to the reactor, the more and more safety measures have to be put in. Just consider God's glory as we've seen it gazed on it in the book of Exodus. It stood between Israel and Egypt's armies. It was what shook the mountain with thunder and earthquake and lightning and fire. It was what declared to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, but he doesn't let the guilty go unpunished. That's the one who fills this tent. And at this point, his manifest presence so intense that even the, the, the righteous and upright and humble Moses, he, he couldn't go in. And like that nuclear reactor, the tabernacle had different degrees of safety required. If you wanted to go into that outer court, you had to make sure that you had cleansed yourself as an Israelite. So there had to be something in place, but if you wanted to go into the out of room in the tent, you had to be a priest and have gone through cleansing. And remember that inner place, you had to be a high priest because God's manifest presence was there. It all brings home that it is not an easy thing for God to be present with his people. It feels easy only because a greater sacrifice has been given. I wonder if you're a computer geek and you've updated yet from Microsoft 10 to 11. With updates, we know that they're better, but still like what's gone before. And the more you use them, the better you realize they are. Gamers, I'm talking, I think, maybe to one or two of you here. You know that when you get the update, it's very exciting. Well, just think about how God updates the old covenant to the new covenant. First, think on Jesus. How much better even than what we find with the tabernacle. There, Jesus comes as God's glory in person, tabernacling amongst his people and making full atonement for sin so that we don't need something morning and night. So that when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's not a Catholic idea of somehow offering Jesus again. 
He makes atonement once for all. So we can now come so close to God that he's not hidden away behind a curtain in a desert somewhere. He's inside us. And we're not consumed. But think now on the church, how much better the update is for us as a community. After Moses completed his work, God descended. After Jesus completed his work, God descended on that day of Pentecost, didn't he? And so in our first reading, Ephesians 2, 22, in Christ, you too, us, Grace Church, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I mean, you, you can't really quite conceive that, can you? We had a lovely uh, evening for formalizing membership on Friday. And we were talking, we were looking at those words. The astonishing thing that just as God manifests his presence in that tent that traveled with the people through the desert, now he manifests it in us as a church family. We are to be the foretaste of the new creational life to come here in this world. We're to be, if you like, an embassy of the coming kingdom of God behind enemy lines, so to speak, but in which the king himself has taken up residence. It's a vision, isn't it, to have as we start the new year, to be that. And it's with that in mind, I think, this new year, we get three encouragements falling out of Exodus 40 that could be ours. I really think these were the encouragements it would have had for those back then too. You see, speaking of Israel in Exodus 29, 46, God says this, he says, I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. Isn't that interesting to hear, hear that again? I'm the Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. In other words, get this, God's whole purpose in saving them through the Passover lamb was so that he could live with them. He freed them from prison and then sort of moved in uh, with the people he redeemed. And it's the same for us Christians, isn't it? God did not redeem us in Christ primarily to get us to heaven, but to get us to himself. He redeemed us not simply so that we would live for him, but so that we would live with him. Now, every day, and ultimately in the world to come. And so here's three ways that should really encourage us this new year. Firstly, it really should motivate our service. Exodus 25, no, Exodus 35, it tells us how the people of God were involved in making the tabernacle. So Exodus 35, 21 and 22, everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting. They brought gold jewelry, all kinds of brooches, earrings, rings and ornaments. Again, Exodus 35, verse 25, every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple or scarlet yarn or fine linen. Exodus 35, verse 27, the leaders brought wink stones and other gems. And then we read how the Spirit of God actually came down on two particular men and gave them the skill of design and craftsmanship to make the tabernacle and to teach others to share in that as well. Now, there's a wonderful truth there about how God uses us. But the important thing I think here is that that would have been really costly for those people, giving up their precious stuff. It would have been really time consuming to, to use all their skill to make the stuff for this tabernacle. But consider how they would have felt when they reached verse 34 and they saw the cloud lit up with the glory of God descending on it and then so filling it that even Moses couldn't go in. You know, if you're a bit of an artist, a craftsperson, when you see the results of your work, there's satisfaction, isn't there? To see the living God taking up residence in the palace you've constructed, it doesn't get better than that. Just think back to this Christmas. Did you have family visit? I bet family visiting at Christmas meant that you were more active in preparing than you've probably been throughout the year. 
wonderfully. You do the tidying, hoovering, dusting, shopping, cooking, serving, preparing some games to play with them because they're coming. You want to be ready. Well, how much more the effort that we would put in to this, our church, in which we host the living God. Christ has brought into being the tabernacle that is the church. And we are called to keep on adorning it. Through evangelism, we gather new spiritual stones. Through our discipleship ministries, like a craftsman with a chisel of God's word, we, we shape those new stones so they fit rightly into it. And we shape one another in our groups and in our one-to-ones and in our encouraging of each other so that we might be beautified as fitting pieces for this palace of the living God. That's the great goal of every member ministry, to beautify the church as the bride of Christ. So we are a fitting dwelling place for his presence, by his spirit now and in person at his return. Above all else, this is why it matters how we conduct our life together, doesn't it? So that we are a fitting residence for the living God. And that's why godlessness in churches is so, so serious. And in the end, it leads the Lord to withdrawing his presence. Revelation 2, he talks about lampstands, which are, you know, the presence of God's glory in churches. And he says to one that's veering from him, I will remove your lampstand. I will remove the presence of God from amongst you. Thinking some of the churches in great decline, that's what we're seeing in our own day. So as we start the year, do consider, and we're so thankful for all that everyone gives, but do consider, you know, am I sufficiently giving of myself and my money to the adorning of God's temple, the church, to its work here and perhaps elsewhere? It can be exhausting. It can be very easy to sit back and hope others will do it. The wonderful thing I think at Grace Church is that everyone rolls their sleeves up and gets stuck in. But it's worth it, isn't it? Because this is the temple of the living God. Second encouragement as we start the year, it should direct our living as well, this presence of God. That's the sense from verse 36. Do have a look down. I do hope you've got your Bibles open. So we're tracking it and making sure that this is what God says to us. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they didn't set out until the day it lifted. Many of you know that I climbed Kilimanjaro a few years ago. I go on about it because I've not done much else that's exciting in life. And that was the one thing. Um, and no one does it on their own. You have to have a guide because actually it can be quite dangerous. A number of people each year die climbing the mountain. And there's a very real sense in which you walk in the footsteps of the guide. We had a lovely guide, um, a Kenyan called James, who turned out to be a believer. So he and I were the only believers on our, our trip with another 12 of my mates. So we had really good fellowship, but we would walk in his footsteps uh, up this mountain. Uh, and we would do everything that he said. We camped when he said camp. We got up and went when he said, let's get up and go. I remember having climbed from about half past 11 at night till dawn in the morning up the last really steep few thousand meters and I got to this the crater ridge at the top and I was so exhausted I fell asleep and he nudged me and said you can't sleep here we've got to go because he knew he knew we had a certain amount of time to get to the summit and get down he knew that the biggest killer on Kilimanjaro is hypothermia we had to keep going that's the sense here in verses 36 and 37 Israel had to navigate the desert hostile people groups and their willingness to follow the Lord exactly was a, a, a confidence, a, a step of faith in him. He knew what was needed to do. They were dependent wholly on him. So as we begin a new year, you know, kids, adults, are you going to follow the Lord in this way as we enter into 2022? Individuals, yes, but also as the corporate people of God. 
I think there's a reminder here that we as elders need to seek the Lord's will about what we do. But in the New Testament, the apostles didn't always wait for absolute clarity on that before they moved. So I think the main application here is about following in the footsteps of Christ. He's the one who goes before us now, isn't he? He's the mountain guide who's climbed the mountain already. Just hear these words from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, some of you are feeling very weary at the moment. It's January, of course. Perhaps you're tempted to give up on this great climb to the glories that await us. Perhaps you're starting to wander off Christ's path. We only do that when we're not thinking straight, as you don't when you get altitude sickness. Well, this new year, fix your eyes again on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the one who has gone before you. Be prepared to follow in his way. It's the way of the cross, the way of obedience to the Father, the way of suffering and sacrifice. But in these Hebrews verses, it's the way of joy as well, isn't it? Joy in knowing we're pleasing the Father and knowing what awaits us at the end. Christ and his way is the only way to our promised land. And there's application here as well, isn't there, to obeying the Lord as he leads us through his word, ensuring that it is our guide. I think it's an important detail at the beginning of verse 36. Can you see it there? In all the travels of the Israelites, this happened. You know, there was nowhere they journeyed where they weren't following the Lord. So no section of our lives that's exempt. We don't say yes to following the Lord at church, but not at school. We don't say yes to following the Lord when we're with Christian friends, but not when we're with non-Christian friends. We don't say yes to following the Lord when we're online at work and everyone sees what we're looking at and not when we're online at home on our own. It's 24-7 Christianity. We follow the Lord in all things. So let's throw off that self-reliance that we're so prone to in our culture, thinking we can go it alone in life. We need the presence of God, don't we? We need to follow in his way, the way of Christ and the way of Christ's word anything else is as foolish as climbing mountains without a guide two wonderful encouragements the third one is god's presence should also in all this calm our fears look again at verse 38 so the cloud of the lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the israelites during all their travels. Wouldn't that have been encouraging? To see the fiery cloud of God's glory, of the pillar at night there, as you worried about what the next day held. He's there, it's okay, he's with us. Well, Christian, what we're learning is that this year, as all years, the Lord is with us. You know, life throws curveballs, doesn't it? You enter into New Year, you just do not know what is around the corner. What could be around the corner tonight or tomorrow? Things suddenly go wrong. Some people can suffer real anxiety over that because we just feel so out of control. But as a Christian, the one thing we can know is that whatever we have to face, whatever this week or this year brings, we do not face it alone. The Lord is with you and with us there's no greater truth and we don't have the fiery cloud or the pillar to look at well subsequent generations when they got into the land didn't either like us they look back to the manifestation of god's glory but we look back not to that time we look back to the time of jesus We look back to the astonishing things he said and did and his resurrection from the dead that proved the reality of God as Jesus promised to be with us always. And so just as Jesus said to Thomas, because you see me, you believe, blessed are those who have not and yet have believed, we have to see by faith now. 
We have more of scripture. We have more of the spirit. And so through faith, we look back to the glory of God in Christ as we read of him in the gospels and are encouraged again, this is real. You couldn't make it up. And we look back to God's glory manifest in the church as you find in the church when it is what it should be, a difference you don't see anywhere else. That's the glory of God. And we're encouraged. He's real and he is therefore with us. I wonder if you've ever read the story of when the king of Aram sent the great force of soldiers to capture, capture the prophet Elisha. Do you remember that one? And Elisha's servant is looking out at all these soldiers in their chariots and he's just getting a bit wobbly at the knees. And then Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And you can imagine the servant looking him around and thinking, hang on, Elisha, it's just you and me and the hordes of Aram chomping at the bit, ready to take us. And then we read, the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's our reality now and every day. That's what it is for the Lord of all creation to be for us with all his hordes of angelic beings that the Bible tells us are sent to minister to the saints. You know, it's not make-believe. It, this is the reality. If we were to have eyes open to see what's really out there. So King David can pray in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And Jesus, as we heard earlier, commissioning those apostles fearfully to go out into the hostile Greek and Roman world and try and make disciples of all nations, saying, look, surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, who the night before he died, said, look, I won't leave you as orphans. To those who love and obey me, me and my father, we will come to you and we will make our home with you. That's a promise to us as well as them. Father and son living with us, tabernacling with us always, traveling with us through whatever we're traveling through this week. So let's not be infected with the anti-supernaturalism of our generation and sort of live as if God is just up there and he kind of lets us just get on with life as best we can. He is wonderfully up there, but he is also wonderfully in here and in here as well. That's our encouragement. You know, like Israel, we're on a desert journey to a destination that we've never seen, threatened by spiritual enemies and by all the hardships of this world. So as we finish this series in the book of Exodus, as we go into 2022, we need to remember God has redeemed us so that he could be with us in that, now and always. And so at every stage of your journey, your time at school, your time at work, being a child, being a teenager, being an adult, being elderly, when a parent or a grandparent parent, through illness, through financial worry, through sickness, through grief, through death itself, the Lord is with us. The God who defeated mighty Egypt by governing the elements, who parted the sea, who shook the mountain, who provided quail and manna against all the odds who defeated the Amalekites as Moses in desperation held up his hands, who graciously persevered with the people despite the seriousness of their sin, who eventually did so much more than that for us in the person of his son. He is with us. He really is. If only we will keep our eyes fixed on him. Well, with that in mind, let's bow our heads, shall we? Um, and let's, let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, you know our concerns and our worries, the state of our own hearts and minds at the moment. And we pray that you would minister the medicine of your word to us in this, in this moment now. Father, where we're weary, would you strengthen us? 
Where we are worried, would you grant us peace? Where we're struggling to trust you, would you give us faith? Where we're ready to go, would you give us humble reliance upon you? Oh, Father, we thank you that you are with us now and you will be with us always. Keep us close to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm very aware that we have had a lot to deal with today. So actually, although we don't usually do this, we're going to skip uh, the next song and go straight into communion. Uh, and that's actually a fitting thing to do, I think, because as we come to this table, we are remembering the presence of God. The idea is that as we're gathering here, Christ is the unseen guest, just as he was physically present at the Last Supper the night before he died. And the bread reminds us of his body broken, the wine of his blood poured out. And by that means, we are cleansed so the Lord can live in us and be with us always. Uh, what we do whenever we receive is that we'll come up uh, six or so at a time and I'll nudge you at the right time. Just come up, take a bit of bread from the centre and have a bit of that. I think we've got some gluten free. Oh, we haven't. OK, so. I'm afraid if you're gluten-free, you're going to miss that. But take a bit of bread from the centre and eat that. Then take one of the cups, just drink that. And then if you could leave the cup on the table, not putting it back in the wooden trays, that means that we know it's been drunk. Um, and if you want non-alcoholic, that's in the cup there in the middle. I'll just give it a wipe in case there's more than one person that wants that. But otherwise, just take one of the little cups uh, where there is wine. And this is for all baptised Christians that are saying yes, I'm seeking to call on Christ as my saviour and live with him uh, as my Lord. And if that's not you, that's absolutely fine. Uh, just sit there and reflect on what we're remembering. Well, let's have a moment of quiet, shall we, now? Uh, a chance for you to reflect and to prepare yourself to eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for bread, for wine, for the gifts of your creation, but ultimately for Christ, his body broken, his blood poured out for us, to pay the penalty for our sins, to satisfy your justice, to turn aside your wrath, to enable you, the holy God, to live in and with us sinful people. And Father, as we come, we therefore come confessing again our many sins, and wickedness. Forgive us the wrong things we've said and thought and done. On the basis of Christ, our Passover lamb, our once thought we will sacrifice. Cleanse us again, inwardly and outwardly, that we might know the fullness of your presence within us. Strengthen us by that presence as we eat and drink, looking uh, to Christ in heaven for all the benefits of this new covenant that he has established with us. And we ask it all for his sake. Amen. Well, it was on the night before... Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread and gave thanks. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I tell you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Well, before we come and receive, let's say these words we often say together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you, Lord, are the God of our salvation. 
and you share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Musicians, why don't you come up first uh, and eat and drink?
we're going to sing in a moment. Just before we do, just uh, acknowledge Jeho is going back to Korea this week. So we do want to send you with our blessings uh, very much. It'll be lovely to chat with you uh, outside. Yaron's staying around, which is brilliant. Um, but, you know, the Lord bless you uh, as you go back. And um, he, one of, one of the wonderful truths today that he watches over you um, back there and your daughters, you know, here. So wherever we are, he is with us, which is great. Let's pray before we sing to close. Father, we do thank you for this great truth that's been purchased as a reality for us through the death of your son on a cross. And Lord, in the light of that, we give ourselves to you, seeking to serve you, to follow your leading and be calmed in our anxieties by you this coming week. Amen. Well, we're going to sing Love Divine and off the back of what we've been thinking about, just think about the words as it talks about us as the temples of God uh, that he's bringing ultimately to his new creation. Can I say, if you've got children upstairs, would you mind going to get them as we sing so that they are uh, finishing at half past five? That'd be wonderful. Let's stand and sing. the words of the grace are going to come up on the screen and let's say these words as a way of blessing each other in the Lord. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Brilliant. Well goodbye everyone online. Do chat to one another if you are able to and for the rest of us the drinks is always outside. Church continues as we chat to each other. But do go in God's grace, mercy, and peace. Uh,